Hi guys, I am Plumman from Alpha Beta Air Analytics. Here I would like to present the concept of the company's franchise value with one simple hypothetical example. This example has been developed by Martin Leibovitz and Stanley Kogelman. Yes, it is simple but presents the idea of franchise value deeply and in very easy to be understood way. The great idea of franchise value can be presented with these several formulas. For simplicity, here and throughout all the example, we are going to talk about unleveraged company only. Therefore, we talk about a company financed only with equity. Of course, adding debt to the discussion will make the presentation much more complicated. But we believe that if you can grasp the idea in its simplified form later, it will be easy for you to upgrade yourself with the debt issue. As we can see, this concept assumes that the value of the company consists of two parts parts, tangible value and franchise value. From other side, franchise value is a multiplication of book value, F factor and G factor. Behind these simple formulas, we can see deep and serious economic logic. To be able to understand this logic, we move to the leibovitz kogelman example. This table consists the whole example we would like to talk about. Here we have four companies. What can we see at the first glance? All of these four companies have the same capital, $100 book value. They also have the same required rate of return. That means that their cost of capital is the same, 8%. Two of them, C and D, were more effective than A and B. While A and B provided earnings $8, companies C and D provided $10. So we have four equal financed companies with the same required by investors rate of return, two of them more productive than others. Then we calculate the value of these four companies and we assume that the price will be equal to the value. What we see is a huge difference in value. One of the companies is evaluated five times than its book value, other 1.25 and another took only one. And when we look at the resultative price earning, we observe the same astonishing results. While first three companies are valued with 12.5 multiple, only company D is valued with price earning 50. Obviously, there are some radical differences between these four companies which lead to these dramatically different valuation results. That is why we are going deeply in this example. Let's start with company A. With capital $100, it provides $8 earnings. Therefore, return on equity is 8%. Remember that all companies here are unleveraged. The dividend policy of this company is with payout ratio 1. Therefore, all earnings are paid as dividends. Dividends are $8. Because of this dividend policy, the company does not provide growth. The return for investors, stockholders, consists of two parts, growth rate, which is usually accepted as capitalization, and dividend rate. In case of company A, investors will get only dividend rate. Total rate of return for them is 8%. When we apply simple Gordon formula for evaluation, we get the company's value $100. So, let me conclude for that company. What we have here? A company which provides return for investors exactly equal to the cost of capital. In other words, the company earns exactly what the investors expect from it. The company provides no growth. Result, the value is equal to book value. Price to book is 1 and the company's earnings are evaluated at 12.5 price earning. Now let me compare A with the company B. This company has the same profitability. Return on equity is the same. The only difference is that B has different dividend policy. Only 25% of earnings are being distributed as dividends. Others are retained earnings. This time, the company provides 6% growth. The final return for investors is the same as in A, 8%, but 6 of which comes from capitalization and 2 from dividend rate. In spite of differences in growth, the value of the companies and their price earning are the same. Therefore, the growth cannot add value to the company. The company B is evaluated in the same way as the company without growth A. The common feature 
of A and B is that both of them provide return for their investors, equal to required rate of return. If one company performs exactly as stockholders expect from it, that company will be evaluated without premium to its book value, no matter if it provides growth or not. Actually, it is basic logic of corporate finance. If company only covers its cost of capital, this company does not add value for the investors. Investors value this company only as a sum of assets. Only company with performance higher than its cost of capital can add value. That is exactly the case with the next company C. Company C performed better than previous two companies. It provides $10 earnings and of course return on equity is higher, 10%. This company has the same dividend policy as company A, payout ratio 1. Return for investors is 10%, higher than the cost of capital, 8%. This situation leads to higher value, 125, $25 more than book value. Resultative price to book is 1.25. Therefore, ability of company C to produce higher return than expected provides value premium to book value. However, if we look at price earning multiplier, we observe something strange. This company is priced with the same level of price earning, 12.5. From the case with company C, we can conclude that a company providing higher return on equity than required creates value higher than book value. It is understandable. Obviously, this company possesses some additional to assets sources of income. It could be non-accounted assets or some intangible assets as management skills. Therefore, this company gets premium above its book value. From this perspective, C is different from A and B. But if we assume that the value is created by ability of the company to provide income, the situation looks different. The company is priced with the same price earning. In other words, the earnings of the company have the same quality as of the other two. Although C provides higher return on equity than required, its earnings will be valued absolutely the same as other companies which do not have this quality. And the final case is that one with company D. What we see here is just one financial miracle. Apparently, this company realizes the same earnings as company C, but its value is extremely high, $500. Not only that, as we see, its price earning is significantly higher, 50. Therefore, its earnings will be evaluated four times higher than the other companies. Why company D is so well evaluated? Why is there such big difference between it and other three companies? Now it's time to comment the formulas we started with. Let's look again with the simple value concept developed by Leibovitz and Kogelman. According to the model, the value consists of two parts. One connected with earnings evaluation, other with book value evaluation. The foundation, the base of the value of the company is formed with its tangible value. Tangible value presents ability of the company to provide earnings. In fact, this is nothing special and it reflects the well-known concept of earnings valuation. A company creates value to the stockholders only if it creates profit. More intriguing is the other part of the value, franchise value. It is involved in the model as being premium to tangible value. Therefore, one company will be evaluated with premium to the ability to provide earnings only if it has ability to create franchise value. Franchise value involves book value in the formula of valuation. Mention that book value doesn't present in tangible value. But here book value is being corrected with two factors. F factor presents ability of the company to provide income higher than it is required for. Value premium will appear only if one company is able to produce more income than the cost of capital. Therefore, in order to increase value above book value, company must earn more than stockholders required from it. However, F factor is not enough as a requirement for the company to create additional value. It must provide also G factor. Therefore, company not only must earn higher than the cost of capital, but also has to provide growth to keep this advantage in the future. Only with both positive factors, F factor and G factor, book value will be counted in total company's value. Otherwise, according to the formula, 
only pricing of earnings will form the company's value. That was exactly the case with the example we present here. Now we can explain that fascinating miracle with company D. If you look again to company A, we see that no F factor, no G factor for it. Result is no franchise value. This company earns what they expect from it and distributes all its earnings as dividends and no growth. And only tangible value forms its total value. Company B has growth factor, but no F factor. Again, no franchise value. Company grows, expands, invests, but not increasing in its value than standard tangible value. Therefore, if the company cannot provide F factor, expansion cannot increase its value. This growth is in vain. First two cases are more or less understandable, but company C presents a strange case. It has F factor. Therefore, it provides higher return on equity than cost of capital. This fact seems good enough and we expect that value should be established with premium to its tangible value. However, because C does not provide growth, no G factor, and cannot create franchise value. The complex influence of the two factors, F factor and G factor, explains the miracle with D. Only that company provides two factors. Combined influence of both factors leads to such high franchise value. The company not only provides higher than required earnings, but additionally provides growth. From this example, we have learned that the value of one company depends on its ability to provide higher than required income and to provide growth. Only simultaneously activating these two factors can add value to the standard earnings evaluation of the company. I am really thankful for your attention.